you know, so there's a lot of areas where folks can come away with the wrong conclusions or they just don't know. And right. uh, they go out and they buy whatever SaaS application and then they have to rip and replace because it wasn't better amp moderate equivalent mistakes can cost more money in this case as well a lot of money now welcome to the cmmc proof podcast i'm your host derrick phillips certified cmmc assessor and provisional instructor today i'm thrilled to have jacob hill joining us how are you jacob doing well how are you Doing good. Counting down to Christmas. My two-year-old and four-year-old are yeah, they're on pins and needles. They're waking up here <laughs> even early every morning. Like, is it Christmas yet? <laughs> How about you? Are you in the Christmas spirit? Yeah, yeah. Um, my leave from my day job started yesterday, and I'm off through the uh, new year. So uh, looking forward to it, spending time with family. Always a good time. Awesome. Are you doing any traveling? Doing yeah, holidays? Staying in the area, thankfully. So. <laughs> uh. Lucky you, yeah. <laughs> Good to stay, stay home. But great, Jake. I'm really thrilled to have you here. I know you're in the GRC world. You are a celebrity, so I'm feeling special <laughs> to, to have you on the CMC Proof Podcast. But before Thank we you. jump into the, the interview, I, I always like to ask some guests, what do they like to do for fun? How do they unwind? It relieves stress in terms of IT world. It's stressful. Right. So uh, mine is probably a little bit unique. I actually really enjoy singing and mm -hmm. back in, I'm not a musician, uh, but I am a singer. And back in 2006, I found this vocal training program called Singing Success by a vocal coach in Nashville uh, named Brett Manning. He had, he was associated with another uh, very well-known Yoda-like figure uh, named Seth Riggs, who was probably the founder of Speech Level Singing. And then I moderated a vocal technique forum for a few years. And a fun fact, a gentleman who was learning to sing back then is now today a vocal coach. And he has about, he has over 500,000 subscribers on YouTube now. It's like, wow, wow. you know, hard work pays off. So I, I love to see that. I, I'm still singing myself. I've slacked off on the training. I want to get back into that. But, uh, you know, I, that's what I enjoy. I love it. Wow. Cool. A singer. I don't think I would have guessed that. That's why I like asking that question. You never know what people are into. That's right. <laughs> Certainly singing isn't one of my gifts, but hey, can't have it all. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned being on vacation from your day job. Uh, can you tell us more about your, your background and what you currently do? Yeah. I started out in IT back in 2008 and I was 18 or 19 back then. And I was supporting the a DOD contract, uh, MRAP actually. Uh, okay. That were, it was those big old vehicles that were meant oh, to yeah. help against the IED threat that our folks were facing out there. Right. And uh, back then, it was it was funny because I, I looked really young, of course. <laughs> Still do. And I had to convince, <laughs> I had to convince yeah. these people that I was worth their time, you know? Yeah. And uh, I did that. And uh, great experiences, you know, got to meet a lot of different people. I got my start back in GRC probably in 2015, something like that. And maybe 2014. I don't, I don't, I can't recall. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was in actually a government employee at that time at Marine Corps Systems Command. And then I rolled off to supporting a, a weapon system at their transition from DIACAF to RMF. And mm -hmm. then I came to where I am today. Uh, I'm a director of cyber operations at Alamo City Engineering Services, a small defense contractor. And I came on board to do an RMF ATO for a security uh, tools uh, enterprise mm -hmm. deployment throughout the Marine Corps. And I uh, got to do that. And around 2017, when I came on board, my CEO asked me, so what is this 800-171? <laughs> <laughs> and do we need to worry about it? Do we need to account for it? And so that's when it actually came in my view. Okay. And then a few years after that, I rolled off of that contract I was on and focused on corporate security and compliance full time. And have been preparing for CMMC ever since. 
Wow. So you, you've been in the game a long time as far as support <laughs> defense contractors. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, stuff I can relate to. I served in the army. So right out of high school, uh, serving in, then also being in Iraq and Afghanistan, I had the opportunity mm -hmm. of riding in those MRAPs. So yes, uh, appreciate the work you did on those, helping keep it us safe. <laughs> yes. It's a great thing. So I follow you a lot on LinkedIn. I think you, you publish a lot of great content through um, your GRC Academy, but what impresses me most about you, as you mentioned, you have a day job, you're, you're mm -hmm. a director and you, I'm sure that consumes a lot of your time and energy, but on top of that, you're building a brand with the GRC Academy. Can you tell us more about the GRC Academy and the challenges it is in terms of balancing having a day job and building <laughs> the, your brand with GRC yes. Academy? Yes, I launched GRC Academy really early this earlier this year. And the reason I did it was because if I'm remembering correctly, my I was looking at the training landscape and essentially there wasn't a lot of training out there for defense contractors. A right. lot of training for consultants and assessors, but not really anything for the defense contractors themselves. And as a defense contractor myself, <laughs> I could appreciate that problem. Uh, and actually, I was going to put the training out on Udemy, but I decided, well, I've got, I'm also a web designer and web hoster. So I said, I have these skills. Let's build out this platform and let's see where we can take it. So I launched GRC Academy, launched the CMMC overview course, focusing on defense contractors. Now the training is also on uh, GSA Advantage. Hopefully be able to make some government sales and help them out, wow. you know, because the government has to understand this stuff as well, you know, right. <laughs> and, and previously at Marine Corps Systems Command, I had the opportunity for a, for a short time to be a contracting officer representative as well okay. as a project officer. So got to work with uh, the folks in, you know, contracting specialists and things like that. So I have a, have some insights that, you know, maybe are a little bit more unique. So, uh, right. you know, it, very, very interesting. And as far as balance, I don't know <laughs> that there is much balance right now. Uh. <laughs> it's, it's very busy. Um, one of the things that I launched in March, I think, was my podcast. And mm -hmm. for me, if I was just recording and then sending it off for editing, that would be one thing. But for right. me, just editing takes so long. And so hopefully one day I'll be able to outsource my editing. I have a company in mind, so we'll see how this goes. <laughs> no, that's that's great. And yeah, let me know how that goes because I, I don't like doing editing either. It takes a lot of time, <laughs> but hey, we all have to start somewhere. So that's right. But I, I would say you're, the GRC Academy podcast. I enjoy watching it. Had the pleasure of being on it. I think you're doing a great job with with just interviewing and editing. And also congratulations about the government advantage. That's a big deal to oh, get your, thank your you. course into them. And that was one of the primary reasons I wanted to invite you on the CMMC Proof podcast because I know your course is helping people get a good understanding of what CMMC requires because there's so mm -hmm. much confusion. Just and yeah, no one understands what what needs to be done so for you to create that course that that's awesome and later in the podcast we're actually going to have you do a little demo for us to show us how my audience which consists of the higher ed mm -hmm. it senior leadership how they can leverage it to teach their people about cmmc so mm -hmm. lo loving that now you mentioned as far as in your, in your current role um with your company that your the CEO came to you in like 2017 asking about this 800-171. How did you first start teaching yourself about it? And then what were some steps that you took to position your company and ensure that you're all were compliant? Yeah. There's a few lessons learned here after <laughs> looking back. Just a few. And, <laughs> just a few. Right, right. So I started by reading the security controls of 800-171. And oh, yeah. I just skipped to the security controls. I did not read the rest of the document, uh, which I would highly recommend because there's a lot of context you're going to miss if you don't read the entire document um, or take my course, which will tell you everything <laughs> right? <laughs> in bite-sized chunks. Um, but uh, the basics of it is that's what I did. I looked at the security controls and I was, I was going back through my emails uh, back in the day and 
uh, I was kind of a little embarrassed at what I was saying back then, just early on, because I was new to 800-171 and I did not know exactly what was going on in the context of it, right? Uh, so uh, I know I'm not the only one at that point who who is like that. And even, <laughs> even today, I'm sure there's a lot of folks who are just now getting their eyes on it and they're in the same boat. Reading the entire document is uh, pretty important. It just to understand the context, what is the purpose of it, what is in scope, what's not, and then move on to the security controls and the technical implementation that you need to take care of because uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And right. just understanding the context and having that background and foundation is really important before you get started. Yeah, that's so critical to your point, kind of breaking it down into bite sized chunks because for someone, approaching uh NIST 800 for the first time it can just be overwhelming you're like yes. oh this document is over 100 pages where do i start <laughs> be able to break break it down into chunks makes a big difference so i'm glad that your course really focuses on you know, bite-sized pieces because mm -hmm. if you try to eat that elephant in one bite it's not gonna not right. gonna work absolutely so in addition to your course what other materials do you offer to help people get a good understanding about CMMC? Yeah, I have some security control explorers on the website. Okay. And what I like about those is they put not only the security controls in a web format, but also the extremely important assessment objectives or determination statements. Because if people just look at the security control language and they don't look at the assessment objectives as well, they're just gonna miss things. And the assessment objectives are what an auditor will be looking at when they come to do your assessment. So you really need to, as you implement the controls, also evaluate your compliance at the same time with those assessment objectives. And that way you're doing it at the same granularity as right. the assessor will. I know that will pay off. This is something I learned when I was working RMF for a large weapon system and we had to get folks in the room. And if we just looked at the security control language, we were going to miss things uh, that the yeah. assessor later down the road would come. So what we did is we looked at the assessment objectives and we said, okay, how do we meet this one? How do we meet that one? How do we meet that one? Any failure at the assessment objective level will result in a failed control. So right. that's really critical to do it at the same granularity that the assessor will. I totally agree. And I always know when we're consulting with clients for CMMC mm -hmm. and they say, oh yeah, we've already done a gap assessment. I'll say, all right, did you look at just the, the practices or did the assessment objectives? And like, what are assessment objectives? Like, okay, right. you, know, we, you didn't do an accurate uh, gap assessment because to your point, really always try to explain it as a question, the practice being more so the parent level question and then assessment objectives are just that it's objectively mm -hmm. validating if you have the practice fully implemented. And that's what the assessor's mm -hmm. going to look at. They're not going to take your word for it. They're going to look at those assessment objectives, want to evaluate evidence and make sure that you do have those practices implemented. So, yeah. yeah and it's also nice. interesting because we had to, we had to implement and prepare for certifications for ISO 27001, 20,000 Tech 1, and 9001 uh, oh, wow. yeah. about four months ago. And we passed, you know, so all the hard work we did for NIST <laughs> paid off, uh, which yeah. is another interesting point. But what I will say about NIST is 800-171 is the security requirements. CMMC focuses on those security requirements and pulls them in. But 800-171 alpha is the assessment procedures and right. they're separate documents. Uh, so that's why just reading these documents uh, and understanding context and understanding what else you need to know is so critical. And that's one thing I do give the Department of Defense credit for their CMMC assessment guides for level one, level two. They do combine uh, mm -hmm. 800 171 and alpha, so they combine the assessment objectives. So. And that's, and when it comes to government agencies, they don't really go out of their way to make things clearer and more <laughs> user friendly, but the DOD did a good job there. It's not yeah. separate documents. I always tell people to start with the assessment guides. Right. Because you, you, and then also they include discussion section. They also include examples. So it helps give more context, which yes. I like a lot. 
The other aspect of this is the contractual clauses and just understanding what the requirements of those are. DFAR 7012 has a lot in it. <laughs> and there's a lot of confusion, I think, on, especially when it comes to FedRAMP equivalency or the cloud that you're using that will hold CUI. And then is it all cloud systems or is it only those ones that have CUI? And that's a great point. And yeah. I see that a lot with our, our clients when maybe they were trying to navigate CMMC alone and they didn't have the expertise and they were just trying to buy these solutions and maybe it was marketed to them that, Hey, this is a, the one size fits all, or this is the magic bullet. This is a buy, buy, the, buy solution and you'll be compliant. And they, they don't realize that no, it's not that easy. <laughs> it's it's That's always right. going to be a shared responsibility. And it's unfortunate when you see defense contractors or subcontractors buying um, tools and applications that they don't need and it's not compliant. Mm -hmm. So now that's yeah. money down the drain. They can't recapture and have to break the bad news to them. Like, no, you can't. This the solution is not compliant. So it really is unfortunate. It is. It pays to have someone that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, it can save you a lot of money in the long run. <laughs> and, and, and I know recently you had a, a FedRAMP expert on your podcast. I watched that podcast, did a deep mm -hmm. dive on it. So what were some key takeaways that you recall from that podcast interview yeah yeah well i had i had two folks talk about uh fed ramp to an extent a uh, dell tech came on uh michael mm -hmm. greenman from dell tech and he had a brief conversation and covered uh, the fed ramp experience z scaler uh, patrick perry from z scaler came on yeah that's the one i watched their approach pretty well and what was interesting for them, I mean, they're they're a large company, right? Right. And so for them, it was another compliance initiative, just another one, right? <laughs> I mean, they you know they are a security company, and and there are a lot of small security companies that say we're a security company, and yet their corporate <laughs> their corporate right. setup is not very secure, perhaps. It's kind of like if you're a web designer and you're like, I build great websites. Just look at my clients. Don't look at my website because I don't put right. a lot of effort into that. You know, exactly. Um, what I would say is was interesting is he talked about the different processes, how to get into FedRAMP because you, it requires a sponsorship right. either from an agency or you go through what's called the joint advisory board, the JAB, which if I recall right, is a combination of GSA, DHS, and DOD. I think I have that right. And he said that the JAB is the gold standard because then DOD has additional processes uh, for their cloud applications that they want to use called right. the DOD impact levels and the cloud SRG and all that stuff. So his point was that if you're engaging with the JAB, then you're already in touch with DOD. And so there's some benefits there. So, so Jacob, you also mentioned that your company just went through getting certifications for ISO. Can you talk to us more about what went to that decision to do ISO in addition to your 800-171 and how the mapping worked and benefited you all from already being compliant with 800-171? There were some contractual requirements that we were seeing that required ISO. And we decided that, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go after these opportunities, these types of opportunities that are coming out. And we're just going to get these ISO certifications and, and knock it out. Mm -hmm. So starting from 800-171 was, was interesting. I, I would say that if you implement 800-171 in a way that checks the boxes, uh, when it comes to other frameworks, you'll probably have a lot more work to do. If you use compliance as a leverage to implement real security and proper security, um, that will take you far, whatever framework you're using. Right. And so that was our approach. And when it came to ISO 27001, we really didn't have too much that we had to account for. Okay. And uh, what's interesting about 800-171 versus ISO 27001, which is for security, is NIST 800-171 is all focused on CUI and it's scoped to assets that have CUI. Whereas mm -hmm. ISO 27001, you, you're in charge of the scoping and you can scope it to whatever systems that you really you want. Um, right. So from our perspective, we applied 800-171 to our entire corporate systems, not okay. a non-clip approach, because we're a small business, you know, about in, in number of people of about 20 some folks. Right. And a big DOD presence, uh, especially initially. 
And so we made the decision, we're not going to set up an enclave. We're doing a lot of DoD business. Let's go with the all-in approach and <laughs> apply 800 to 171 uh, everywhere. Got and it. so we migrated to GCC High and did all that good stuff, you know, um, and uh, that was an interesting uh, experience. <laughs> <laughs> but what I will say is that we really didn't have to do too much because we applied the security controls everywhere. Uh, there was some documentation and some aspects of ISO that uh, weren't accounted for, like privacy uh, controls right. and things like that that are, are not part of 800-171. Um, and I also engineered and uh, implemented all of the, almost all of the technical aspects of the corporate system and Wow. <laughs> have Zendesk in play for corporate IT ticketing and all that stuff. So the way the way I built it, uh, 20,000 Tech One was not that much of a challenge either, thankfully. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because certainly 800-171, even though it fo focuses on confidentiality of the data, it's pretty mm -hmm. comprehensive. And so and having experience helping companies get SOC 2 um, prepare for their audit or ISO 27001, I would say if you're already compliant with 800-171, organizations in good shape yes uh, absolutely now i know there's a lot of talk within the, the dip as far as hoping that the dod allows maybe reciprocity where if a company already has 817 i mean or if they already have iso 27001 that maybe that could be um have the, that the dod will accept that in lieu of simum c what what are your thoughts about that do you think that is something that is feasible or you think 800 is more comprehensive than ISO 27001. It's a very good question. I had a Dr. Ron Ross on from NIST on my mm -hmm. podcast a few months ago, and he was talking about why they did not adopt ISO 27001 and why they went ahead and built their own security control catalog. This yeah. was going back to 853, if I recall right. right. And he was saying that, well, there were some really big gaps that 853 needed to account for. So they went ahead and did that. I okay. would say that 800-171 is very much more focused um, on the problem that the federal government is trying to solve, uh, right. whereas ISO 27001 can be applied to all kinds of different systems. Uh, I think it's a good standard. I don't... I don't know that I have a great answer for you yet because I haven't I haven't put in the thought that would be required to give you an excellent answer. It's it's a very interesting question. The user, the organization, is in charge of scoping, right? For ISO, right. Um, right. So that's a whole nother ball of wax there. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, a great question. I don't know how I have a great answer. <laughs> no, the insight you provided from Dr. Ron Ross is really helpful, and I I would have second that. I agree that. There's a lot of gaps in comparison, so I certainly yeah. would consider it a, a, a one for one because 800 is a lot more intimidating, especially if you think about it in the context of CMMC level two assessment, where you're going to have someone, an assessor, come in to objectively verify all of the required evidence and technical and administrative controls. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more intimidating than ISO 27001. You have a, mm -hmm. a lot more control on dictating how that assessment goes and the scope and so, yeah, it's a policy. It's Another a point here, though, is that going back to the executive order for control and classified information back in, I think it was 2010, 13356, mm -hmm. 13556, maybe. Things so, uh, under Obama. The, yeah. yeah, the executive order um, encompassed the confidentiality of CUI. And so they tasked NIST to uh, come up with something to address that. Right. And so NIST said, well, we have 853. And, uh, and I think, I think if I recall right, I don't remember if the executive order said the moderate baseline or if NIST said the moderate baseline, one or the other. Um, but they're kind of tied in with 853. And right. then they build 800 171 as the derivative based on that executive order. And right. then we have these, you know, regulatory. Uh, contractual clauses that are tied in with 800-171. So there would have to be a good bit of untangling done in order to have reciprocity with ISO. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier on, as far as your journey with getting your, com your company complying with 800-171 and some lessons learned, what are some things you wish you knew prior to starting that journey that would have made your life a lot easier, the process more streamlined? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. Well, I think what I said initially is read the manual, <laughs> read <laughs> yeah. 800 171, get the context. Um, as far as lessons learned, I think it would have been good if I would have started with a data centric approach of where is the FCI, where is the CUI, and then move on to the technical security controls. I went technical security controls because I didn't understand the context of 800-171, right? right. Uh, so scoping is critical, understanding where the data is is critical, and really 800-171 is a data-centric standard, uh, not unlike HIPAA or privacy laws, where right. the regulated data is health data or privacy data. In this case, the regulated data is controlled and classified information. Right. Um, so it's a data-centric standard. Uh, the other item I think is I would have integrated into the business processes sooner than I did. And to be honest, it was a very small team, myself and another person, really myself doing a lot of this. And so I didn't have the resources to uh, do a whole lot of other things. But I think integrating into the business processes sooner than I did uh, would provide value because as security professionals, we can only do so much. We need, a, we need everyone else on board. Right, right, exactly. And so it, in order to achieve long-term success from a compliance standpoint, the organization has to be on board. You have to right. enable them, you know, through SOPs that are not just security SOPs <laughs> that they right. may never look at, but integrate into their SOPs, you right. know, and add in your requirements so that when they look at their processes, they say, oh, yes. The security thing, we have to make sure we account for that, right? Because right. we're security minded, not everybody is. Exactly. Um, so you have to integrate into those business processes. And then the other item, and this is the critical one for defense contractors, whether you're a large prime or small, is prioritizing the compliance, the determination of compliance of your partners. Right. And that is a hard one. For a small contractor, it let's we were a prime in many uh, scenarios. So the large contractors out there, they already have their questionnaires. They already have, uh, you know, everything they they need to right. evaluate a, a subcontractor's compliance. But for the small guy, you got to do all that stuff. You know, yeah. how do you evaluate your compliance, your partner's compliance of eight hundred one seventy one? How do you right. um, make sure? everything's above board and you're just not saying, do you have an SPRS score? Oh, it's 110. That sounds great. Let's go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta trust but verify. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think those three points are some big lessons learned. Yo, those are excellent lessons learned. And to your point with the data centric approach, that's why when we're consulting with clients, we always start with scoping because if you jump into the technology, going back to what we initially were, discussing is you're purchasing technology. You don't even know what you're trying to protect. You don't know if the technology is compliant. You don't understand the requirements yet. Right. So you definitely don't want to start with the technology. You want to know, okay, where is that CUI or FCI coming into our organization? Who has access? What systems? Where is it stored? What partners have access? All you have yeah. to do that hard work first, and, but it's so important. So many organizations, especially small organizations, they'll think, look at CMMC as, oh, this is an IT problem. We'll get, give it to IT. They'll handle it, get us all ready. We don't have to be involved. And that's not the case. It has to be the entire organization and it has to be integrated into the processes and demonstrating that maturity. I really appreciate you sharing that insight. Yeah. And something else I would mention is when I had you on my podcast, I really appreciated what you said about security questionnaires and that if a prime contractor is responsible for implementing certain security controls, whether it's from the government or if it's, or if you're working with another organization and they say, we want you to apply this security standard. You said, it doesn't make sense if your subcontractors aren't also accounting for the same security requirements. So right. this is a, not a new thing, this flow down situation. Exactly. Uh, it's not new. And I, I really appreciated you bringing that. I got a light bulb there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I've watched several podcasts with Dr. Ron Ross, and he mentioned the requirements follows the, the data, follows that CUI. So it doesn't matter how small the contractor is. It's a yes. sub, it doesn't matter. It's, they're trying to protect that CUI, right. the confidentiality of it. And you as a defense contractor or a sub, 
wherever you're at in, in that supply chain, you have that responsibility because you have that sensitive data. So it's so important mm -hmm. to, to understand that. I know you recently had the pleasure of speaking at a conference. So tell us about that experience. Jacob Horn invited me on LinkedIn uh, to speak at the Summit 7 CS2 conference in Denver. And it was cool. I had been to a a CMMC day here in DC, another security conference uh, focused on CMMC. And I, I came back invigorated, right? I was like, <laughs> wow, for folks who are working in the defense contractor space, um, it can, it, it, sometimes it can become a grind, you get pushback and you, things like that, you know, so that can become a bit tiring, but uh, being around people who understand the problem we're trying to solve and things like that. You can really get a lot of extra motivation and uh, oh, inspiration yeah. from that. So I, I think the conference is a great, um, on the CS2 conference, I spoke on my experience implementing 800-171 and it was good. <laughs> I told everyone that I hope you can't tell this is my first time speaking at a conference, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whether or not that's true. I don't know, uh, probably, but I put a lot of effort into the presentation and the information. So in any case, I think people came away with uh, some good points. Yeah, that's fantastic. And Clearly, you know some people in some high places who you think about <laughs> hear the names of Jacob Horn or Dr. Ron Ross. Those are, are legends in the CMMC world. <laughs> and there are people who are continuously delivering value to those who need to comply with CMMC. But also, to give you credit, your name is starting to really get starting to enter those circles as well. Because when I think of people that's delivering value, your name comes to mind as well. So certainly oh, keep you. up the good work. I'm sure you'll be speaking at a lot more conferences <laughs> and <laughs> love it. Now, I guess this would be a good, oh, before we go into that. So as far as at the conference, I think you had mentioned about doing a education panel. What did you glean from that yeah. experience? Yeah. So that was on my podcast and oh, actually okay. I had the opportunity to bring a higher education panel that gave a panel at CS2. And I had a conversation with him after that. I enjoyed it so much. It was so fascinating. And I said, would you be willing to come on to my podcast and uh, do it again, you know, and uh, have that conversation? And they agreed. So that episode is not out yet. It's in my ever growing okay. editing backlog. <laughs> However, very fascinating. I uh, had reps on from uh, Notre Dame. Uh, University of Arizona, University of Maine, as well as uh, Duke University. Wow. And so hearing them talk about all the different challenges that they have from a higher ed standpoint was really fascinating. A few things that struck me was how large, especially some of these universities are. Oh, yeah. And many of them have sports teams with stadiums like, that hold thousands and thousands like and thousands small of small cities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he said that we're like small municipalities you know right uh they some of you some of them even have their own police departments exactly um, and fire departments and <laughs> everything else so that's fascinating they have all to hear about how much they have going on the other aspect is the number of compliance initiatives that they already are accountable to being that they have so much involvement uh, even in the sports there's compliance requirements for that uh, mm -hmm. There's all kinds of different compliance requirements um, that uh, that I can't recall uh, that yeah, that like he mentioned. Verba, I, COPPA, so many. Yes, of them. <laughs> yes, yes. So that was fascinating, and it was like, okay, well, this NIST eight hundred one seventy one thing is just another one that's had exactly. to lift from their perspective, <laughs> right? And uh, the other thing that struck me was really, and I think this is we can probably say this across the board is their exclusive use of CUI enclaves. Being that they're so large, it never would make sense for them exactly. to apply 800-171 across the board. Um, mm -hmm. Now, there was an interesting question at CS2 that was asked, and it was basically saying, okay, this certain privacy information is controlled on classified information. So how are you accounting for that within your corporate systems? And the room kind of went silent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, who knows what might happen with that. But, but for now, they're using CUI enclaves across the board because they're so large. Right. Uh, the investment to apply 800-171 across the board would likely be uh, pretty cost prohibitive. So very, very interesting. 
Absolutely. I'm really excited and anxious for you to, to release that podcast episode and I'll be sure to update it in the in the podcast notes and share it because and that's why I'm so excited about really focusing on serving uh, higher ed and research institutions because they have such unique challenges. Yeah. And and yes, yeah, really going to take CMMC professionals that are specializing and have a deep understanding of what their unique challenges are to properly serve them. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach for their right. CMMC compliance. Absolutely. Now with that, with them leveraging um, CUI Enclave, some of them I'm sure are also going to have to leverage like GCC High, which you, know, you have experience implementing GCC High. What are some lessons learned in terms of with the GCC High that you have? Yeah, I think a big common misunderstanding about GCC High is that I get GCC high and it solves all my problems and I don't have to do anything. <laughs> right. Send it <laughs> and forget it. All. Yeah. Autopilot. <laughs> yeah. Fire and forget. It's not true at all. It is a version of Microsoft 365 that uh, is supported by U.S. persons and is hosted in the United States. And that's about it. <laughs> right. Um, it costs more because of the U.S.-based supports, and uh, you, they have to set up those data centers within the U.S. for exclusive use for DoD uh, contractors and other entities who might be in there. Um, and also, they have to account for the DFAR 7012 requirements and the incident response requirements, so that's why it costs more. Uh, but it's just like any other instance of Microsoft 365, you are fully responsible to implement the security around it and secure that environment. When I was first going into it, the feature set in relation to commercial, it was not great at Limited. all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's come a long way. It's a ton better, right? Um, and we have some collaboration capabilities now with the commercial environments, if that's a need, things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, there are some uh, frustrations that come from operating out of GCC High. Uh, uh, but, but it, but things are getting better. They're a okay. ton better than they used to be. And like I said, with the collaboration capabilities that are there with commercial cloud, uh, that that's a lot better as well. Uh, there are some interesting features from, uh, an Intune perspective that I am looking forward to because oftentimes new features and commercial come out and it's like, okay, so when GCC high, <laughs> right? Right. It's and <laughs> so there are some interesting features for Intune. The other really interesting aspect is Microsoft Copilot, which I'm sure you're very interested in as well. Oh, yeah. And when GCC High will probably get that is sometime next year. I don't know if it's first, second, third quarter, but uh, so that's that's exciting. I was glad to see that. But uh, commercial is definitely going to get it first. And okay. um, I'm excited for Copilot for a few reasons, but one of the reasons I'm excited about it is in integrating into incident response and being able to provide context, uh, you know, uh, based on all the information inside of that tool and bringing it together. I think that's really a great capability. Absolutely. So it kind of helps help streamline things, but to your point, there's no fire and forget, no set it and forget it. Just because you're in GCC high, you still have work to do. Any cloud service is going to be a shared responsibility model. That's right. And yeah, the customer has responsibilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be nice if it was uh, just yeah, put on autopilot. That, I think the cars now have adaptive cruise control, hands off. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way with any of these yeah. solutions. I don't care what the salesperson tells you or what the marketing no. said. It's run. It's fraud. If someone's telling you that. You <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But, Jack, I think this is a good time to jump into a demo. We'd love to see some of the solutions that GRC Academy offers. Sure. So the first resource I'm going to show you is the CMMC Control Explorer. I had actually updated this based on the document leaks that came out of rulemaking. Uh, so you'll see a set of security controls for CMMC level three here as well. Okay. Uh, the basics of it is we have a searching capability, fil some filtering based on the domain or a control family as 800-171 calls it, and then uh, the CMMC level. Uh, the keyword search uh, does comb through the requirement text as well as the discussion text. I know a lot of folks use this and I myself have used it when I'm going through uh, self-assessments because to be honest, it, it's so much nicer and more readable than a, a spreadsheet, uh, which right. I'm using. If you have a fancy GRC tool, that's amazing, uh, but a lot of folks don't have that and they can't shell out the 
10 to 30 to 40, 50 K that that requires. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, this is just a resource for those types of folks. So if we filter to the CMMC level two controls, here they are. Um, we can look at authorized access control 3.11. And uh, I did my best to make this uh, a really friendly, readable view. Um, so you have the requirement language, here's the discussion, and then some uh, metadata here, the level, and then the related 800-171 ID, as well as the eight related 853 IDs, okay. and the DOD scoring methodology points uh, from uh, that will account for your SPRS scores also. Wow. And then we have uh, further discussion. People have been asking NIST for implementation examples for quite a long time. Right. And uh, NIST did provide that initially, but then they pulled away from that. And the reason why they did that was because they said, well, if we provide implementation examples, people might believe that's the only approved solution out there. And that's right. what NIST does not want. Um, yeah. What DOD did is they, pro they did go and provide some examples. And I think that's appropriate for an agency to do that. Right. At, you know, at the agency level, that's fine. I can understand NIST hesitation to do that from a federal standpoint, covering all kinds of different agencies <laughs> and organizations. Yeah, exactly. Um, but DOD did provide this further discussion a section with implementation examples, and I think that's really helpful for folks to kind of get the understanding of what the security control is kind of going for. Mm -hmm. And then below here is the assessment guidance. You have the uh, examination. Uh, processes here, the methods, what they might look at to make sure that you have actually implemented this. So a number of documentation items, your access control policy, uh, security plan, system design documentation. This does not mean all of these. This is just a list of some of the things that where you might have it. Uh, right. And the auditor might be able to reference. The auditor also can interview these folks here um, and then to test um, you know, there's some options for the auditor right there. Uh, then comes the determination statements or the assessment objectives. What I'll say here, going back to our previous conversation, is you'll have a one control to many assessment objective or determination statements. Uh, so um, what this does is it breaks out the control text into individual testable items. So <laughs> if we only had the requirement text, there are a number of requirements in this text that are separate. Uh, from a testing and auditing perspective, you have to break it out. So that's why if we go back down to these assessment objectives or, again, determination statements, you have multiple items. Authorized users are identified. Processes acting on behalf of authorized users are identified devices, including other systems authorized to connect. So th there's a lot of things that are in that requirement language that if you only look at the requirement language, when it comes down to auditing time, you are going to have problems. If, oh, any, yeah. <laughs> of, if any one of these fail, you fail the control. Exactly. So like I said, really important to go through all of these, even as you're implementing the security controls, make sure you've accounted for everything when you're documenting. And then I would recommend doing a full self-assessment prior to your CMMC certification assessment, just so you can make sure that all your, you know, your I's are dotted, T's are crossed, that type of right. thing. Uh, but this is a resource that folks can use. Uh, I do know it gets a good bit of traffic. People uh, seem to like it. And if you have any suggestions, uh, feel free to let me know. I'm always looking to make it better. I think this is a fantastic resource and it's, it's a free resource, right? Yes. Wow. I can tell you put a lot of work into it, but people need to understand that when you're talking about compliance requirements to make it simple, easy to digest and understand. And that's what this resource does. And that could save mm -hmm. people so much time, effort, energy versus mm -hmm. trying to go to the actual special publication and navigate through it and be so confused with all of the jargon. <laughs> and But yeah, you really put this in a beautiful format that's easy to navigate. Well, I really appreciate you offering this to the community. Thank you. Yes, yes, no problem. The other thing I'll point out is I do have security control explorers for 853, 171, oh, of wow. course, and then 172 also. And my plan is to add, once NIST CSF 2.0 comes out, I'll be adding a 
explore for uh, those requirements as well. So we'll, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So looking to expand the catalog of training and also resources that are available for free. The website, so grcacademy.io. Certainly take advantage of this website, you all. And as far as your course, tell us a little more about the actual course you have. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the course is here. Um, I have, like I said, I launched it in January and over time, almost 50 five-star reviews, which has been awesome to see. Wow. I was nervous to put it out because uh, there are so many CMMC experts and I, and some of them are kind of brutal. Right. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I want to make sure this is, this is square and everything's good. So I actually had uh, some folks peer review it. Uh, Miss Corinne Wise Okay. Um, she is a instructor as well as a, a consultant and um, a lot assessor as well. Yeah. And uh, she was kind enough to offer her time to peer review the course. And then Mr. Paul Benjamin as well, he gave me thoughts on the course and that was really a nice thing to do. And, uh, yeah. I was, uh, got a lot more confidence after I started getting oh, yeah, feedback yeah, on it because yeah, yeah. I was, I was pretty nervous to put it out. The basics of the course is it's focused on defense contractors or really anybody who needs to understand CMMC. Mm -hmm. And it gives you that context in the form of bite-sized lectures that run through everything from uh, the DFARS clauses. What is CUI? What is FCI? Uh, what is the background on all these requirements? Uh, and then, of course, CMMC, the ecosystem, which was very confusing to me, actually, you know, the, the different terminology that they use and who does what and it took me a little bit to figure out. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And so you learn all about that in less than three hours and you get, get a great foundation. Um, I've heard some for some folks who have gone through with uh, gone on to get CCP training and they said my course provided an excellent foundation going into the CMMC certified professional. And also, I think it's great for sales teams. If you have a GRC tool out there, getting your sales teams, the knowledge that they need to be able to speak more intelligently is really good as well. So I think that this has a lot of great lessons learned inside of it, the curriculums here. And uh, I'll also talk about FedRAMP because that's a piece related uh, yeah. to DFAR 7012 and gearing up to update it whenever CMMC <laughs> releases the uh, the rule. So any day now, fingers crossed. I hope it comes <laughs> soon. <laughs> wow. No, this is great. And I know it's reasonably priced compared to something like the full training because I teach the, mm -hmm. the CCP course and the CCA course. And I try to give people context because those courses are five days long. I think about 40 hours of training. So so many details. So be able to provide a course like this is more concise, high level for uh, organizations, just help them get yeah. an understanding, a foundation. Yeah, that's very important. And it goes a long way to let them know, okay, these are, this is what's expected of us. This is what's yes. required. Real high level. Again, just thinking about that end user, making sure it's digestible for them because I see so many organizations get just overwhelmed by all of the the jargon and just it's so much it's so confusing so anything that you can do to cut down on that confusion yeah you're doing great work yeah and i'm actually logged in so you can't see the price but it's 249.95 uh so really affordable very inexpensive Absolutely. um and uh i had one gentleman just say that it's he estimated that it saved him 10 weeks of research uh to, i can imagine easily like, I, I can believe it because if i had something like this starting out, I would have been in a lot better place than I was initially. Uh, the other thing that I'm excited about related to GRC Academy is I'm moving to a, a SaaS LMS and there's a community feature uh, that basically is like a forum that I'm very excited about. Uh, get people engaging in that and asking questions and things like that. Uh, oh, wow. So I, I'm super excited about this. The last thing I'll point out is I do have NIST cybersecurity framework training as well. Mm -hmm. uh, through the DVMS Institute, okay. and uh, it's accredited through uh, APMG International and uh, actually has taken off in the U.S. as well as uh, the U.K. and internationally as well. So uh, really wow. good resource there. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. You're really demonstrating your skills. I know you say you're a web developer and that's apparent. And I would say it ended up being a great idea for you to host it yourself and not put it on like yeah. Udemy or anything like that because you're making it so much better than they would offer it yeah, on their platform. Yeah. Can you just talk more 
to your passion for why you're doing this. It's clear you have a passion for it. You really want to serve the defense industrial base. So yeah, just I'm just curious more about your, your, that driving force for you behind all of this. Yeah, coming from that small business perspective, I think the amount of confusion that I experienced and just there were so many different resources out there. I mean, a lot of them are excellent. Mm -hmm. You got great blogs, great YouTube videos out there. But I think one of the goals of this course here, the CMMC overview course, was to bring excellent information uh, together into one spot and in a curriculum format that is available and uh, folks can just run through without having to go to a hundred different resources just to get started, just to understand the, the foundation, be able to then form an action plan and not be led blind by <laughs> yeah. a consultant, right? Um, that right. hopefully they know uh, what they're doing, but you, you know, uh, the registered practitioners, uh, any, anyone can become a registered practitioner. You definitely want to make sure you understand the requirements from a basic standpoint, at least, so that you can make sure whomever you enlist is definitely uh, steering you in the right direction. You know, that definitely excites me. Uh, also, just helping folks get into this field uh, excites me as well. I love seeing it when uh, I have a student and they say that your course, you know, helped me actually get a CMMC oriented position. I had one lady that I reached out to on LinkedIn because she was asking if there were some training resources or she was trying to get a CMMC oriented position. And I said, okay, well, here, um, let me give you a free code for my course and just wow. uh, see where it can take you. And it helped her get into a CMMC uh, project management orient oriented position. And so yeah. I love being able to help people in that way. You know, at the end of the uh -huh. day, <laughs> You know, you could, making money is great, but being able to feel good about your work and the what you're doing for other people too mm -hmm. is, is really important. Wow, a absolutely. And just hearing that story about the lady, that, that just gave me chills because you're making a real impact and you're changing people's lives mm -hmm. and helping them progress their career. And yeah, it's just, it's amazing. Like once you're putting out content and with just that focus on serving it, the impact is just, yeah. it, you just can't even quantify it. And I, I love every time when you're sharing reviews about that you're posting on LinkedIn from your um, people who took the course and it's just really cool to see it. And it, it clearly are getting good value from it. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. You did all the research. You also, you speak from firsthand experience and you put it into a con concise course. Uh, I recently had a client that we're helping with CMMC prep, mm -hmm. and he mentioned one of the people on his team. He was like, Derek, do you have any, like a course or some type of training that's really kind of straight to the point, high level overview? I don't want to send this team member to like a CCP course, CCA. I just want them to have a foundational understanding. And knowing about your course immediately came to mind, like, oh, you know, Jacob Hill, are you familiar with his course? And yeah, I was so happy to refer him to take this course because I knew Thank it would you. give them just what they need to get that foundation. So it really yes. serves that segment of the market. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and I know you're going to continue to put out more, more great resources. Great to see that, that journey. As we get ready to kind of wrap up this podcast, it's been an awesome interview, giving a lot of great value to our audience. I really love it. But I'd like to close out by asking our guests, any book, podcast, or movie that has had a profound impact on their lives personally and or professionally, what would you say? Yeah. One podcast that I really have appreciated is Darknet Diaries. Okay. And what I love about it is it's number one, it's engaging. It's exciting. He brings in all kinds of different security professionals, uh, whether it's compliance folks in some cases, but a lot of times it is penetration testers. Uh, even folks who were on the criminal side <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, has conversations with them. And it's very enlightening. There's a few excellent podcast episodes from that, that I would highly recommend. Mm -hmm. One is called Operation Glowing Symphony. Okay. And that was an episode with Mark for cyber actually. And I, at the end I was thinking, how did he get this? Is this authorized? And then mm -hmm. I looked on their Twitter and, it, and they said, yes, you know, we were able to speak with him. And so I was like, Oh wow, that's awesome. It was wow. basically about how they were taking down uh, ISIS media servers that were spreading propaganda to right. those terrible videos that they were putting out. Um, and then there's another episode about um, 
social engineering, really. And mm -hmm. I think it's called just visiting. The way I use these, I use it for security awareness in our company. And what I do is I, along with the other security awareness videos and trainings, I say, listen to this podcast. And what I love about it is it kind of brings it in their face a little bit of how a social engineer actually operates or why it's not a good idea to use personal assets for work. Uh, there was another great episode called the LinkedIn incident. And mm -hmm. I think back in 2012, they got hacked. And the way they got in was a LinkedIn engineer had a, a web server on his home network. So the bad guys were able to, number one, they found him through LinkedIn. And then right. they said, oh, he's got a web server. Interesting. It looks like- Interesting. <laughs> interesting. So yeah. they, they compromised his web server. And then they were able to laterally reach his Mac uh, computer mm -hmm. uh, that uh, was his personal computer. However, <laughs> he had an SSH key or something oh, like that, yeah. maybe, you know, a private key or something right. uh, that he used to, uh, to operate uh, and access LinkedIn corporate networks. And that was on his personal computer. Yep. So a lot of excellent lessons learned that can be definitely taken away from all of those episodes. And uh, I love using it to educate my my staff on security awareness topics. So I think it's a great one. And uh, folks should definitely check that out. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to check it out. I'm certainly going to add it to my list. I'm always looking for a good podcast to, to listen to. So yeah, thanks for sharing that. Sure. Well, Jacob, I appreciate you being so generous with your time. I know that you have to get ready for the holidays. You're on vacation. Mm -hmm. So that's when you know you talk to a dedicated uh, security professional, even on vacation. They're willing to do podcasts <laughs> and just give back to the community. So that's fantastic. I really appreciate you joining the CMC Proof Podcast today, Jacob. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the content you're putting out. Out and thank you for everything you're doing because you're definitely making a difference also. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Your, your inspiration to me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And you too. If you receive value from this episode, I invite you to subscribe and like so that you're the first to know when we release new episodes. Also check out cmmcproof.com to learn more about the arsenal of resources that we provide to equip you to conquer CMMC. We'll see you next time.